You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday the 17th, 2013. 2012, more British soldiers commit suicide than were killed in battle. Schoolboy denied water to avoid upsetting Muslim pupils during Ramadan. Scottish pupils fed imported chicken and Scottish prisoners eat the best Scottish beef. Italy, pernigotti chocolates sold to Turkish group. Forced HIV testing in Greece violates human rights. Dutch government gets tough on welfare benefit tourism. Boko Haram leader calls for more schools attacks after dorm killings. Muslims petition UN on Burma persecution. Paedophiles want the same rights as homosexuals. Thought for the day, it's too hot for multiculturalism. And finally, toothy tales. Before I read today's news, I would like to thank all my listeners for their good wishes, thoughts and prayers. They must have worked because here I am, looking like a nationalist hamster and thankfully very, very numb. After days of thinking salt water could cure a gummy thing, I went to the dentist and saw a German locum who, bless her, did an x-ray and then showed me the result. I went away with a prescription for antibiotics and luckily had ibuprofen at home. I overdosed on the clover oil, which I got on menaces from local chemist staff on pain of death or worse, and couldn't feel my face for 24 hours, but could, however, still feel the sodding abscess. I would say that before I get to the boring stage, that I have produced children, had operations, and all the things that go to make one's life medically fulfilling to the pharma industry, but never have I had such pain as this. In fact, I strongly believe that all wars, killings, dictators, old and new, have bad attacks of tooth troubles. Hell, Stalin must have had a permanent jaw ache. And as for the Muslim hate preachers, I will never say this again, but I could have and still could kill for England. Just point me in the right direction and the result would be mass graves all over the place. Just call me Jaws Mozart. Now, to the news. UK News. 2012. More British soldiers commit suicide than were killed in battle. BBC's Panorama discloses that at least 50 serving and veteran soldiers took their own lives in 2012. This is more than were killed in wars. The Ministry of Defence confirmed that in 2012 seven serving soldiers were confirmed to have killed themselves while a further 14 died in suspected suicides but inquests had yet to be held. Although the government doesn't record suicides amongst former soldiers, an investigation by BBC's Panorama revealed that 21 serving soldiers and 29 veterans committed suicide in 2012. The 50 suicides exceed the 40 soldiers who died fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan during the same period. World Date says, We should appreciate our armed forces much more than we do. In fact, we need all the ex-soldiers to join the British National Party to form a much-needed force which we Brits will need in the future. We should take monies from the EU to do it as well. All European countries should have their own standing army as a matter of course. Schoolboy denied water to avoid upsetting Muslim pupils during Ramadan. Many pupils at Charles Dickens Primary School, Portsmouth, Hampshire, are fasting during Ramadan, which means they refrain from taking food or water between sunrise and sunset for around 30 days, depending on the moon. Cora Blagden, 32, claimed a teacher at St Luke's School refused to let the 10-year-old drink from his water bottle because it was unfair to fasting classmates. Mother of four, Cora said, just before bedtime, me and my sons, Luke 10 and Alpha 8, were talking about Ramadan, as we'd seen it on the news. Luke said to me he was told he wasn't allowed to drink in class by his teacher. The reason being, a child who was fasting had a headache and the teacher said it would be unfair if the other children drank in front of the pupil. The teacher, who has not been named, made the ruling on Thursday last week when temperatures soared to 28 degrees. Ms Blagden com- confronted Deputy Head Lisa Florence before the lessons began last Friday and was given a verbal apology for the incident. The school said there was no ban on children from other religions having food and drink during Ramadan but refused to comment on this individual case.
Portsmouth City Council, who run the 300 Pupil School, also declined to comment. World of Date states, Gutless individuals, these new style teachers. If a Muslim child needs to fast, I would strongly suggest they stay at home to do it. Can you imagine a Christian Roman Catholic school making a Muslim eat fish on Friday during Ramadan? They're not in their own countries, so when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Scottish pupils fed imported chicken. Scottish prisoners eat the best Scottish beef. Pupils in six out of seven cities across Scotland are fed chicken imported from as far away as Thailand, while prisoners tuck into the best Scottish beef. Yesterday, shocked Scottish Greens, who found out sources through a Freedom of Information request, called for councils to ditch foreign poultry for food produced at home. Alison Johnson, Green MSP for Lothian, said, There's got to be a better way than flying chicken nuggets from Thailand. We must aim for local, high-quality food. Councils are under pressure to award contracts on costs rather than make choices to have a positive impact on the local economy and animal welfare. The Scottish Government need to do more to get local food used in meals brought with public money. The Greens found Dundee, Edinburgh and Perth use Thai and Dutch chicken, Glasgow and Aberdeen Thai and Inverness Dutch. Meanwhile, the Scottish Prison Service received fresh quality meat from a specialist butcher who uses suppliers in Aberdeenshire, Ayrshire and Speyside. Word of eight. Prisons. Bread and water and work. No halal, no special food, no prayer rooms and Thai chicken. What is the difference between an old people's home and prison? The food is better in prison. European news. Italy. Pernigotti chocolates sold to Turkish group. Pernigotti chocolates became the latest historical Italian brand to end up in foreign hands. Last Thursday it was sold to the Turkish Toxos group. The 150-year-old chocolatier, famed for its Gian Duetti hazelnut-flavoured nuggets, has annual sales of around 75 million euros. Last week, storied cashmere firm Loro Panier was swallowed by the world's largest luxury group LMVH. LMVH has acquired several iconic Italian brands over the years. Last month, it purchased a majority share in Milan's historical Cova pastry shop brand, based in the heart of the city's well-heeled fashion district. In 2011, it took over a luxury Italian fashion brand, Bulgari. In the same year, fashion house Brioni went to France-based PPR, and a controlling stake in Montclair was sold to French investment company Eurozio. France is not the only foreign investor in iconic Italian fashion houses. In 2012, the Qatar royal family bought the Valentino Fashion Group, VFG, under its holding company, Mayhula, for investments SPC. Forced HIV testing in Greece violates human rights. The reintroduction of obligatory testing for hepatitis, HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and communicable diseases clearly violates human rights and medical ethics, it is argued. Two weeks ago, the new Greek health minister, Adonis Georgiadis, decided to reintroduce Public Health Decree 39A, which imposes measures such as obligatory testing for hepatitis, HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. The decree stigmatises drug users, sex workers and undocumented migrants in particular. The text also states that any occupants of housing that may cause danger to public health should be evicted from their homes without any alternative being offered. The decree was introduced last year by the then Health Minister Andreas Lavados from the Socialist PASOK party. It resulted in the roundup and forced testing of hundreds of women. Those found to be HIV positive had their names, personal details and photographs published in the media on the grounds of protecting public health. After widespread civil society indignation, nationally and internationally, the decree was overturned in May 2012. Soaring unemployment rates up to 20.6, up to 26.8% in March 2013, according to Eurostat, rising child poverty and people losing their homes because of insolvency every month have left the Greek social protection systems quaking under the strain. The crisis has also generated austerity measures that have deeply impacted social safety nets, including health care provision. As a result, the finger is often being pointed at groups that were already facing social exclusion before the crisis, for example Roma, migrants, sex workers and drug users. World to date states, 39A needs to be reintroduced throughout Europe and the UK for males as well, especially now. Dutch government gets tough on welfare benefit tourism. Rotterdam City Council is to begin experimenting with checking up on the residency status of EU citizens who claim welfare benefits, Bistand, in the Netherlands, Social Affairs Minister Lodzvik Asher said on Wednesday. 
Currently, if EU citizens request welfare benefits, their claims are only investigated after they've been submitted and the money has already been paid out. The experiment means if Rotterdam city officials have doubts about the residency status of a claimant, they will be able to check with the Immigration Service before considering the application. A request for welfare benefits within five years can also be a reason to have the right to residency terminated, the Social Affairs Ministry documents state. In March, the Netherlands, Germany, Austria and Britain wrote to the European Commission, calling on it to address their concerns about the abuse of the welfare benefit system by members of other EU states. According to Junior Justice Minister Fred Tevin at the time, 4,260 non-Dutch EU citizens were claiming welfare benefits at the end of 2011. We know a certain percentage are fraudulent, but we do not know exactly how many he understated. World News Boko Haram leader calls for more schools attacks after dorm killings. Abu Bakr Shekau, leader of Nigeria's Islamist militant group Boko Haram, describes Western-style education as a plot against Islam. He's called for more attacks against schools in a video released days after his fighters killed 46 students in an assault on a dorm. Teachers who teach Western education, we will kill them. We will kill them in front of their students and tell the students to henceforth study the Quran, he said, gesticulating energetically whilst dressed in military fatigues and a traditional hat. Shikau denied that his fighters killed children. Just after dawn on the 6th of July, a school dormitory was doused in petrol and set alight in northeastern Yobi. Those trying to flee the flames were shot. The attack left 46 dead, mostly students. More than 300 classrooms have been torched in the remote arid state since 2009, according to official counts. Muslims petition UN on Burma persecution. Cairo. Muslim states have petitioned UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon to take an action against Burma over ongoing attacks against Muslims in the Buddhist majority country. Myanmar, Burma, is having a honeymoon with the world, Saudi Arabia's UN Ambassador Abdullah al mulalemi was quoted as saying by agents France Press on Thursday, July the 11th. The only problem is that the honeymoon is being built on the bodies of the Muslim victims in that country. The Saudi ambassador and other delegates of members of the Umbrella Organization of Islamic Cooperation met Ban on Wednesday to demand more action by the United Nations over attacks against Muslims in Burma. Burmese Muslims have been facing repeated attacks by the Buddhist majority in recent months. World Date says, good, it's about time the boot was on the other foot. Pedophiles want the same rights as homosexuals. Using the same tactics used by gay rights activists, paedophiles have begun to seek similar status, arguing their desire for children is a sexual orientation no different than heterosexual or homosexuals. Critics of the homosexual lifestyle have long claimed that once it became acceptable to identify homosexuality as simply an alternative lifestyle or sexual orientation, logically nothing would be off limits. Gay advocates have taken offence at such a position, insisting this would never happen. However, psychiatrists are now beginning to advocate redefining paedophilia in the same way homosexuality was redefined several years ago. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. A group of psychiatrists with B4U Act recently held a symposium proposing a new definition of paedophilia in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders of the APA. Thought for the day. It's too bloody hot, isn't it? I may not be in top tip... <laughs> I may not be on tip-top condition now, but I feel it's just too hot for multiculturalism in all its finite forms. Take our soaps, for example. Now, I know a goodly proportion of my listeners feel that they are too intelligent for the soaps, and they're right, but I, however, am obviously not. But even I am finding the storylines and a couple of them wearing thin. I feel we nationalists might as well be hung for lambs or sheep, so we'll come right out with it. I still feel that although soaps per se have to reflect the state of a nation, they actually don't. They daren't, as they would not get on the air if they told a true story. So they err on the side of politically correct crap, and believe me, it is. In EastEnders, one of the two I follow, having given up with Emmerdale, since everyone in it is either the village idiot or multi-ethnic trying to pass as white, 
Now, since EastEnders, which by rights should be known as ethnic benders and have totally non-English players, they have demurred to BBC speak and keep the Muslim family broken up though it is on the sidelines and brought in a half-black illegitimate daughter of one of the more mature white ladies with a ghastly black son who can't speak without in it at the end and an ex-black partner, who must be the ugliest black actor who can't act I have ever seen. In fact, I fast forward all their scenes on principle because they are so incredibly awful. I'm just hoping they emigrate somewhere far away from the square and find the discord they so justly deserve. Now, Coronation Street, or Coro as it's fondly known, has always steered clear of the awful and terrible blight on humanity known as racism, without which all the peoples in all the world would be happy hippos and probably high on drugs, so they wouldn't care anyway who they had to live near. But that dreaded word has come into Coro in the most ridiculous way. And, of course, in The Rover's Return. Well, no one would take any notice in Roy's calf, would they? Coro is getting very up to the minute and naughty with trannies, lesbos, murders, adultery and now racists. Poor old Paul the Farman, he of the dead balmy wife and girlfriend with a slightly ethnic son, has dropped a clangour in pub. Well, shake my ferrets and doff my cloth cap, mates. He happened to say to taxi driver Lloyd, whomever of some space trek fame, who is proudly half black, why do these people always go to the black side when they're half white? E. Obama. That he was not playing the white man. Oh my God. The entire studio must have been an uproar. The few remaining short dreads on his head almost took off. And of course his newly found daughter, who is carrying on a lesbian affair with the uglier daughter of Michelle Lavelle, say no more. And is judging from her mother, Lloyd's old bit on the side, who is large black and usually nasty, so don't really know what percentage of colour there is or isn't, but she appears to be black to me, and of course, like all black women, are portrayed as having large chips on their shoulders, probably from the old days of slavery and white owners, to which this crew adhere to with monotonous regularity. Of course, they nearly pop their clogs. White man, white man alert, you mustn't mention white man to black man. Exterminate, exterminate. I almost expected to see the Daleks, which, actually, on a personal note, I want to be when I die. Just rig my head into a Dalek suit and let me go. Davros Mozar, here I come. Trundled out from the bar and killed poor old Paul without trial. He had said the dreaded words, white. Of course, the writers are trying to bolster the figures, and if they can do so using the race card, they will. Whereupon, large black woman, Leslie daughter, and Lloyd nearly fainted. Paul laughed, and Lloyd then called him a racist. Oh, dear. Oh, very dear. Ha ha. At this time, suffering though, though I was, I was laughing so hard I almost fell off the settee where I was not doing the Monday World at eight. It has, of course, now blown out of all proportion, with Lloyd taking it out on everyone. Paul looking very persecuted and made to look like a member, quote, of the National Front. Get real. The NF would never have him, mates. I'm glad the writers steered clear of the British National Party, as it's well known we welcome all to our party and shores, of course. Paul said he wouldn't apologise because it would mean he was admitting he was a racist, and Lloyd seemed to be almost clenching his fist in a Malcolm X kind of way. When will this Pratt admit he's half white, so why the bother? Another point is, why do they, on TV adverts, plays and series, seem to show black men with white girls all the time? This is sheer propaganda as is the fact that on TV at least all of the part white and black people marry or shack up with full-blooded black people. Were their parents that bad? Part Asians seem to go for white men, which they obviously view as a slightly better bet than reverting to type. Ethnicity has always fascinated me, and despite the no-go areas nowadays, which airs on the side of ignoring a person's ethnicity because one might offend. Why? Even our poor children are being taught the way of common purpose and the machine men, and whilst doing so are missing out on their own culture and identities, whilst being forced to embrace and ignore foreign ones. A dualism not found in the Middle or the Far East. That term, not playing or acting the white man, has been around for donkey's years, as indeed a black man's behind is never fair, which has also been misquoted for the truly bigoted. Their terms of endearment, they are not racist in any sense of the word, now, if Paul has said you're acting like a half-caste prat or worse and used the N-word, fair enough. But he didn't, and it was obvious no offence was intended. But to be fair, 
If you people the entire streets of a northern town with nignogs, mixed races and Asians, you're opening the doors of, what can we say, future non-communicative and problematical situations. How's that? Let's face it, away from the studio lights and TV, if you allow immigration to take over entire parts of a country over a long period of time, you do not get a multi-ethnic community. You get a diversive, multi-ethnic and mixed gaggle of peoples who have no loyalties at all. Which is why the followers of Islam gain. They know who they are and what they want. But that is for another time. Now call me a racist and I'm sure you will, but of course one notices the colour of a person's skin before you talk to them or know them. That is why all people are different. You can roughly identify their culture and more from their appearance. There's nothing wrong in that. So people should be allowed to talk or remark about people's ethnicity or colour in a civilised society. It's never been the case, certainly in years gone by, that jokes and sayings about peoples of other cultures and colours have been classed as offensive until the last 30 years. And we've seen many a demise of brilliant comics who have refused to steer the ship of love towards the multi-ethnic bunch of the so-called establishment lovies now. How this drama on Corrie will play itself out I really don't know, as it's all very odd, but at the same time very British in the people's way of thinking. We seem to be reading from the book of silly phrases, and on the term racist you all know what I think of that, Trotsky and all, where the sun don't shine springs to mind. In fact, I believe in identity over racism. Every nationality of the world should have their own identities and be proud of them. All identities should have their own patches of land to call their own. We should all be proud of our identity. It states to everyone who we are and what we can be. But of course, if one is proud of a white English identity or Scottish or Irish or whatever passes for that nowadays, it's classed as racism and verboten. We should all be allowed to have our own country, virtually free from other identities, who also should have their own countries and stick to them within reason. Why should one or two identities be forced to accept and welcome thousands, if not millions of other identities, with whom they have nothing in common? It simply isn't playing the white man, is it? And finally, toothy funnies. These are two dental funnies for you, and if I can laugh, you certainly can. A woman and her husband interrupted their vacation to go to the dentist. I want a tooth pulled, and I don't want Novocaine because I'm in a big hurry, the woman said. Just extract the tooth as quickly as possible, and we'll be on our way. The dentist was quite impressed. You're certainly a courageous woman, he said. Which tooth is it? The woman turned to her husband and said, Show him your tooth, dear. <laughs> and not to be left out. A man walks into the dentist's office, and after the dentist examines him, he says, That tooth has got to come out. I'm going to give you a shot of Novocaine, and I'll be back in a few minutes. The man grabs the dentist's arm. No way. I hate needles, and I'm not having any shot. So the dentist says, OK, we'll have to go with the gas. The man replies, Absolutely not. It makes me very sick for a couple of days. I'm not having gas. So the dentist steps up and comes back with a glass of water. Here, he says, Take this pill. The man asks, what is it? The dentist replies, Viagra. The man looks surprised. Will that kill the pain? He asks. No, replies the dentist, but it'll give you something to hang on to while I pull your tooth. <laughs> this presenter says, don't blame me, blame the oiler cloves. <laughs> You've been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>